Let's stand together and I'll read to us the passage for this morning. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than, than other beasts of the field that the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and that it was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. He said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave me, she gave the fruit to the, of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, hi guys. Uh, I'm really sorry I can't be with you. Um, I think I'll be in Israel by the time you see this, uh, taking 50 or so people uh, on a history tour of the origins of Christianity. I love it. We must do it together one day. Um, but it's a privilege to be back here and uh, continue in this marvellous series. I'm very conscious that uh, the passage today, Genesis 3, is controversial. And I don't just mean, you know, the scientific questions or the questions of literary genre. Uh, I mean the actual ideas of sin, fallenness, God's grace to the unworthy are often viewed today as harmful, uh, harmful psychologically and harmful uh, sociologically. Um, a few years ago, I posted on this theme of grace and how I think it helps our politics. And uh, this is what I said, and it, and it got a pretty negative reaction. In our current moral and political discussions, I'm constantly reminded of how the Christian doctrine of grace, favour to the undeserving, is a genuine triumph of ethical imagination and strength. Grace frees us to condemn real evil in others without the slightest implication that those people are beneath our honour and kindness. And equally, it allows us to extend compassion to the worst of humanity without any approval of their wrongdoing. By contrast, the cold, shallow moralising of a graceless society only seems capable of either wholly accepting people or demonising them. Well, I still really believe this, actually. Um, when we know that everyone is fallen and everyone is loved by God, it actually frees us at the social and polit political level. It allows us to critique fellow wrongdoers without any implication that they're worthless. And it allows us to love fellow wrongdoers without any implication that we approve of the behaviour. Grace does that. But one of my more sceptical Facebook friends named Robert uh, chimed in and offered this pretty poignant and I think in some ways powerful critique. Let me read it to you. 
Robert said, the doctrine of grace can be damaging because it is inextricably linked to sin and fallenness. For those people with low self-esteem, lack of self-worth, even clinical depression, he basically says, you are a worthless human being, but God still loves you anyway. As someone who grew up with very low self-esteem on account of continuous childhood bullying, when I heard the message of Jesus, it made perfect sense. You are worthless, Robert. It was damaging to my mental health. I saw a psychologist for two years before I made the conscious decision that I am not worthless. When that happened, my need for Jesus disappeared. I was heartbroken when I read that. And what makes it worse is that sometimes Christians do present the doctrines of grace like that. Uh, we give the impression that we're saying, you're worthless and aren't you lucky that God still likes you anyway? I can see how that would be psychologically damaging, as Robert insists. But there's also a social critique of these same doctrines. The well-known uh, atheist philosopher, Michel Onfray, in his book, The Atheist Manifesto, writes, God reveals himself to us only through taboos. The monotheist religions, and he really means Christianity here, live exclusively by prescription and constraints, forbidden and authorised, licit and illicit, agreed and not agreed. The religious texts abound in existential, dietary, behavioural, ritual and other codifications. The greater their number, the greater our chances of falling into error. The fewer chances of attaining perfection, the deeper our guilt. And it's a good thing for God, or at least for the clergy who identify with him, to be able to manipulate this powerful psychological tool. His point is rules, rituals, taboos, right and wrong. This is a means of social control. Uh, and that is how many people today hear the themes of human fallenness and grace. And so what I want to do in this talk is speak to these concerns and wind back to the original articulation of these ideas. I want to go right back to the foundational narrative of the fall of Adam, that is, the fall of all humanity. Uh, I want to make three brief introductory remarks, and then we'll be in a good position to unpack chapter three. Uh, the first thing I have to say about all this is that this is not the first thing the Bible says about humanity. Uh, really, it's important to see that before the Bible says anything about our sin, it says we are made in God's image with a mission to rule the world on his behalf. Do you remember the sermon from a few weeks ago now that Jeff gave that um, unpacks the meaning of this extraordinary expression, the image of of God. We're made in God's image to rule on God's behalf. And Jeff made the point that this means we are all precious to God, of infinite and equal worth. The notion that we are worthless just has no place in the biblical understanding of, of humanity. It does have a place, however, in pagan thinking about humanity. Do you remember a few weeks ago I made the point that um, uh, Enuma Elish was the Babylonian uh, story of uh, the origins of the universe? And in it, humans are fashioned out of the blood of the losing god, Kinju, created as an afterthought in the story, and they're created for the purpose of being simply slaves to the gods. I mean, that's worthless, right? Um, you, you know when Enuma Elish was read out uh, that human beings are nothing, really. Uh, and frankly, the atheist myth that is so common today isn't much better. Remember, it was Richard Dawkins who wrote 
The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at the bottom, no design, no purpose, and no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. By contrast, the Bible's starting point for thinking about human beings isn't their sinfulness, isn't that they're unworthy, it's that they are precious and valuable, that they're made in the image of God to rule on God's behalf. This is the guarantee that we can't be worthless. We are precious. And this is exactly why our wrongdoing, our sin, matters. And this is the second introductory thing that I want to say. The seriousness of sin is a direct corollary of the significance of our status. I mean, what does our wrongdoing matter um, if we're worthless, if we're just accidents in an unintended universe? It doesn't matter. But if we are infinitely valuable to God, if we are the lords over creation on God's behalf, then our wrongdoing is cosmic. It's massive. These two thoughts belong together. And how I wish that my Facebook friend, Robert, could have seen that his wrongdoing matters not because he is worthless, but precisely for the opposite reason, because he is precious, inestimably valuable. But what about the critique of Michel Onfray, the, the social critique, that all of this is just about uh, priests controlling people with guilt? Well, I understand that sometimes uh, clergy have done that, but the third thing I want to say is that far from being all about rules and taboos, Genesis 1 to 3 is all about true freedom. Do you remember the message uh, from a few weeks ago uh, from Jeff, where he unpacked uh, th this part of Genesis 2, where it's perfectly clear that Adam is given the freedom to eat from any tree in the garden. Uh, just one tree was forbidden, but, but the striking thing about this narrative is that only one thing is prohibited. Everything is, uh, uh, is there to be enjoyed. Everything else, including the tree of life, which is the most important tree of all. Uh, Adam and Eve were allowed to eat from that tree. It's just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they were forbidden uh, from eating. And you may remember that Jeff pointed out that um, this idea of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil um, basically means humans choosing good and evil for themselves. That's what that choice is about. I want to experience by my own intellect and discernment what is good and what is evil. And the thing is, that can't possibly be freedom. Um, that's the height of folly for a creature to choose for itself uh, what is the definition of, of right and wrong. Let me try and illustrate this. Um, uh, here is the mighty Leotorp cabinet system with IKEA. Um, and apparently uh, this is one of the most complex IKEA products on the market. The thing is, uh, the genius of IKEA is present uh, within the product itself, in the actual Leotorp, and of course in the instructions that come with the uh, Leotorp. Now, you can decide to improvise if you like, and not follow the instructions. You can uh, decide to skip over, you know, steps 10 to 15 because, you know, you just want to ad lib. Or you can decide to discard the screw at step 50, you know, because you want to express your individuality. You are free to do that, of course, but is that really freedom? You're not really doing yourself any favours when you do that because there's only one way to experience the uh, purpose of the thing. And that is to follow the manufacturer's instructions. That is to participate in the mind of the maker. And here's my point. The genius of God is built into the fabric of creation and it's in his instructions. And so therefore to obey God isn't to curb freedom, it's to participate in the mind of the maker. It's to participate in what we're made for. The fact is, this is true freedom. I love the way Professor David Bentley Hart uh, put this in his book, Atheist Delusions. 
We are not free merely because we can choose, but only when we have chosen well. For to choose poorly, through folly or malice, in a way that thwarts our nature and distorts our proper form, is to enslave ourselves to the transitory, the irrational, the purposeless. It's a powerful statement, and that, enslaving ourselves to the transitory, the purposeless, that is exactly what happens in Genesis chapter 3, in case you were wondering if we would ever get there. Adam and Eve turn their God-given authority into autonomy and their divinely ordained freedom into enslavement to their lowest desires. I want you to notice the serpent's strategy to get them toward this. Um, the whole idea of the serpent is to cast God as stingy, as holding something back. So we read these words. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, that's a cunning restatement of what God actually said. Because remember, God had actually said you are free to eat from any tree in the garden except one. But now the serpent has turned this into you must not eat from any tree. There's a clue here to the serpent's strategy. Now, Eve sort of corrects the serpent, sort of, but even then she exaggerates the strictness of God's command. And it's really interesting. She says, uh, it says, the woman uh, said to the serpent, we may eat from any of the trees in the garden. Notice she doesn't actually quote God. She doesn't actually say, we are free to eat any tree of the garden. Uh, but God did say, she goes on, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you must not touch it or you will die. Notice this. God hadn't said anything about not touching the, the tree. Uh, he had said don't eat from it, but not, not the words don't touch it. Eve plays down the freedom God had given them, and then she amps up. She makes more strict and onerous the actual command that, that God had given them. And the serpent spots this weakness and goes in for the kill and says, God is holding back the very thing you need and want. Here is what we read next. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. How ironic is this statement? I mean, the last two chapters have just been telling us that we are already like God. We've been made in God's image to rule on his behalf. We are made in the image and likeness of God. But now the serpent says God is holding something back. He doesn't want you to be like him. When the very fact is he wants us to be like him, to rule on his behalf. The, the point is... Adam and Eve are being told that God is holding something back. He's not generous. But that is nuts. Is Ikea trying to hold something back, trying to cheat you, you know, by giving you instructions? Of course not. How is it conceivable that the God of the universe would try and cheat us by giving his guidance and wisdom for our lives? And so the climactic scene, though stated uh, plainly, is cosmic and catastrophic. Let me read those middle lines. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Now, before I go any further, I can't resist pointing out one of those examples of the literary sophistication of Genesis 1 to 3. You may remember I spent some time on this uh, in the first talk of this series. The fact is, the whole of Genesis chapter 2 and 3 is a giant 
chiasm, or what's called a palistrophy. These are technical uh, literary devices. Um, this is where the first scene in a narrative corresponds to the last scene of a narrative. The second scene of a narrative corresponds to the second last scene of the narrative. Uh, the third scene corresponds to the third last scene. And then there's a middle scene that doesn't have any mirror. And that tells you what is the centerpiece of, of the message. Um, I'm not just making this up, by the way. Here, here's the brilliant evangelical Old Testament scholar, uh, Gordon Wenham, in his Genesis commentary. The whole narrative is therefore a masterpiece of palistrophic writing, the mirror image style, A, B, C, D, C, B, A. Not only does the literary structure move in and out in this fashion, but so does the action. It commences outside the garden. The dialogues are conducted within the garden and the decisive act of disobedience takes place at its centre. And then it moves back out in reverse order. Um, here's the thing, in case that seems like a lost point or a point that should just stay locked up in Wheaton College or something. Um, this is the central scene of the palestrophe. The whole thing zeroes in on this scene where Adam and Eve eat from the forbidden tree at the centre of the garden. And will you notice that the central act isn't some gory murder or sexual degradation or act of tyranny. It's nothing like that. It's the seemingly mundane choice to not listen to God, but to listen to other voices because they imagined they were missing out if they didn't experience eating this tree. And isn't that our story? Isn't it? I mean, don't we often disobey God um, because we doubt his goodness? Because we think we're maybe missing out on real life if we don't do something? But how can participating in the genius of the manufacturer possibly be missing out on life? No way. And isn't it the case that we typically disobey God, not in extravagant, uh, murderous events, but in mundane choices to listen to other voices and not listen to God. And yet, choices like that are always foolish, not wise. They are enslaving, not liberating. And they are cosmic, never actually mundane. And here's the thing, such choices are also shameful shameful. And our text makes this abundantly clear. Do you remember the preamble uh, to this back in chapter two, we were told that Adam and Eve, before they ate, uh, were both naked and they felt no shame. Now, this isn't a comment on nudity or anything like that, but it is saying um, that there is no shame where there is no disobedience, no shame where there's no uh, guilt. And that suddenly changes in chapter three, with the decision to reject God. The eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid out of shame from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. This is tragic. Shame before each other and before God Almighty. Shame is the subjective clue to an objective reality. It's a little bit like the pain that we feel when we, you know, put your hand uh, near uh, a flame. I mean, in a sense, uh, the pain is subjective, right? Um, at least it's relative because some people feel pain more than others. And in fact, there are conditions where people don't feel skin pain 
at all. Uh, but the thing is, the burning is real, objectively real. And of course, the reality is, although we don't want to be oversensitive to pain, nor do we want to be insensitive to pain. That would be a disaster because pain is there to protect us from the objective harm of the flame. Now, I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. Shame is, in a sense, subjective. Some people feel it more than others. And the fact is, some people have so managed and psychologized and quashed shame that they hardly ever feel it. But actually, shame is the clue to the objective reality of our guilt before God, of our cosmic decision to disobey him. Okay, so let's do a little experiment. Um, imagine our every wayward uh, thought, word and deed in a film that I'm about to play. Uh, think of every ambitious fantasy we keep to ourselves, every sexual encounter online or in the real world, every lie we hope is never discovered, every sharp word uh, we can never take back, all the middle class niceness that we use to cover the resentment, all the dollars we crave and we spend while we neglect the poor or the good deeds we do just to hope that people notice and think highly of us. All of it. Imagine all of it in a film right now as I press play for us all to see. Sit back and enjoy. No, of course, I had no intention uh, of showing your film, or let alone mine. <laughs> but my, th my point is, what is that feeling that you have at the thought of your film being shown live? Is it just a psychological ailment that you can get rid of with counselling? Some people view it like that. Or is it like it was for Adam and Eve? Actually, the, the subjective clue to an objective reality, the rational intuition that we are accountable to the creator, that our supposedly mundane decisions are of cosmic value. There are many ways I could uh, apply our text today. A part of me feels like I could just return to the point I made uh, at the outset um, on social media. Um, the doctrines of sin and grace are the solution to our fraught, tribalistic, political and social situation. Um, because the fact is, when we know that everyone is fallen and everyone is loved, it allows us to critique our fellow wrongdoers without any implication that they are worthless. And it allows us to love all wrongdoers without any implication that we're approving of the wrongdoing itself. Grace is a vital social tool that Christians ought to be expert at. But that's not where I want to land. Um, there's something way more important. Shame itself is a grace of God. Yes, it's the subjective clue to the objective reality of our guilt, our judgment before God. But it's also a clue to something else, something more beautiful. Just as pain is designed to save us from objective harm, so shame is actually a gift from God to save us from judgment. Shame reminds us of the folly and the enslavement of disobeying God. Shame points us to our need for forgiveness from God. And ultimately, shame is the clue to the most important objective reality of history, namely that God entered the world as a man, lived the perfect life that I couldn't live, that Adam couldn't live, that you can't live. And then he offered up that perfect life on our behalf, bore into himself all of our shame, punishment and guilt so that we could be 
freely forgiven so that we need not ever hide from God, but run into his loving arms. Friends, that is the gospel at the heart of the book of Genesis. God bless. That last line in John Dixon's sermon, we need never hide from God again because of Jesus. We can run straight to his arms. Perfect tie-in to the song. And I, I think about that in the Genesis 3 story that Adam and Eve, after their disobedience, covered up and hid from each other and from God. And in many ways, we've all been doing that ever since. Trying to hide who we really are from one another and from God. And the cross tells us we don't have to hide anymore. That he sees, he knows, he loves, and he forgives. And one of the ways we run to him is through communion. Christians throughout the centuries have gathered together and taken bread and cup to be reminded that God has welcomed us in by his grace and mercy at the cross. So you have your communion cups in your hand. It doesn't matter if you're a member of Chapel Street Church, a regular tender, or if it's your first time here. Only two things matter. One, have you placed your trust in Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin? And two, are you willing to examine your own heart right now? If that's true of you, then he welcomes you at his table to run to him. Let's peel off that bottom layer on the cup there. You'll find the bread there. Take it in your hands. And I remind you that Jesus called himself the bread of life and said, this is my body. It is given for you. Eat this and remember him. Now let's peel off that top layer. And I'll remind you again that Jesus, when he was with his disciples at the Last Supper, said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and remember him. Let's stand together for the benediction. Lord God, though we run from you, you run to us in Christ. How we thank you and praise you for that truth, that all of us, regardless of what we've done or where we've been or where we come from, can run straight to you because of Jesus. We thank you for that and we give you all the praise. Now, Lord God, may we go in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the love of the Father, and the grace of your Son, Jesus, now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.